PIC conversation of this year. Our distinguished guest today is Ambassador Ramesh Moulier, who will speak on Macron's France. Our distinguished chairperson is Dr. Shubhashish Gangopadhyay. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our event speaker and chair. During a career spanning over 28 years in the Indian Foreign Service, Mr. Ramesh Moulier served in many parts of the world, including the US, Europe, Asia, and Africa. He has held several overseas appointments, such as ambassador to the Philippines, deputy chief of mission with a personal rank of ambassador in France, and ambassador to Syria. In India, he was the head of the Foreign Ministry's International Organizations Department. After leaving the IFS, Ambassador Moulier established and presided over an international consultancy, Business Promotion Services, BPS, based in Paris. He has written on a wide variety of political and economic subjects and topical issues for various journals and periodicals, including a regular column for Business India. He has been speaker at numerous business and management schools in France. Ambassador Moulier also represented the Confederation of Indian Industry, CII, in France as its strategic advisor until recently. Ambassador Moulier holds an LLM in International Legal Studies from NYU, United States, and bachelor's degrees in Commerce and Law from the University of Bombay. He is fluent in English and French. Good evening, sir. Dr. Shubha... Dr. Shubhashish Gangopadhyay currently serves as the research director of the India Development Foundation, Dean of the Indian School of Public Policy, Chair Professor of Emerging Market Finance in the University of Groningen, Netherlands, and Visiting Professor in the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. Previously, he was the Founding Director, Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Science of Shivnadar University. He was also the Founder, Chief Editor of the Journal of Emerging Market Finance. He has published widely in international journals and has a number of books in economics and finance. Dr. Kangopadhyay has been a member of the South Asia Chief Economist Advisory Council of the World Bank, advisor to the Competition Commission of India, member of the board of the Center for Analytical Finance ISB, the international advisor of the Center for Law and Economics of Financial Markets at the Copenhagen Business School and a member of the Bankruptcy Task Force of IPD Columbia University. He is also the founder president of the Society for the Promotion of Game Theory and its Applications. Professor Gangopadhyay has rich experience of advising students at the PhD level and has a number of students both in India and overseas. He earned a PhD in economics from Cornell, US and a bachelor's degree from Presidency College, Kolkata. Ambassador Mulye, Dr. Gangopadhyay, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And now, without any further ado, let me call upon Dr. Gangopadhyay to start the proceedings. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Shilpa, and uh, welcome, uh, Master Mulier. Um, uh, I must say that my job today is that of a moderator, and as a moderator, um, I will speak as little as possible. My only job is to facilitate the conversation between uh, the ambassador and those who are listening in. There's only one housekeeping um, announcement that I want to make, is that many we will have a and a session. Dr. Ambassador Mulier will speak for about uh, 35 to 40 minutes. And after that, we'll open it up for um, direct interaction with the ambassador. Please put your questions in the um, chat, uh, sorry, in the Q&A box, not in the chat box because I will be looking at only the Q&A box and not in the chat box. And when, when you do type in a question, please make sure that it is short, crisp, and direct. Thank you. With that, I will now um, go over to Ambassador Mulier. Um, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Dr. Gangopadhyay, let me ring him. I think he's. we've lost connectivity with Ambassador Mulier. Let me try and get him on WhatsApp. Okay, okay. Sorry, everyone. Please please allow me a couple of minutes. Is he in France or in India? He's here. He's in Pune.
Ambassador Mule is trying to reconnect. There seems to be some connectivity issue with his home uh, internet service provider. So we'll, we'll uh, give him a couple more minutes, please. And if it doesn't work, I'll try and get him on a WhatsApp call and then we'll broadcast it uh, over speaker. Couple of minutes. I apologize for this, everyone. Sorry about okay. that. Ambassador, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay, yeah, we we can hear you and see you. It saved my internet. So, can I request you? Okay. Internet connection is unstable, Shilpa. Okay, so uh, can I request you to please uh, keep your video switched off and that may save some uh, bandwidth. Connection unstable, Shilpa. Yeah, okay. I'll... Right. Ambassador, we have always felt that uh, Murphy, when he said that if anything could go wrong, it will. We always felt that he was an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Ambassador, please, you can start your speech. I think we've lost him again. I'm there now. Okay. Can you see me? I'm so, there. Yeah, yeah. So if, if you switch your video off. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Please, please continue. Okay. I'm, I'm there now. So. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you clearly. Please go ahead. So I should start now? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the center for giving me this opportunity. And um, I'd like to make a couple of caveats before I speak. Is that given the short time that is available to, to us and given the fact that the internet is not working a great deal, I'd just like to say that I'd like to touch upon a number of uh, issues, maybe not without being able to go into the details, but if there are any issues on which people would then wish to have some clarifications or raise questions, I'll be very happy to do that during the, um, during the question hour period. So uh, let's, uh, to start with, let me start by talking about, uh, um, and I'd like to start by saying that for the paradox, I'd like to tell you why, simply because if we were starting this conversation, say last year around the same time, France was in a relatively good thing. The economic indicators were very good. The uh, GDP was growing at a modest, but 1.2 percentage. The jobless rate was the last, the least in the last 10 years, and it was um, about 8.1 percent. Some of Macron's reforms, which he started in the first year, like the labor reform and tax credits, etc., were beginning to bear fruit, and. Uh, I'm unable to hear him. The longest strike in the history of the French Republic. Uh, people were coming out on the, uh, on the streets every time, the street protests and so on. But then, uh, finally, like this, I mean, the question is always comes, 
And frankly, nobody really has a clear answer. People say the various answers which have been uh, advanced. And I'll just share some of them with you. Some say France is in search of identity after the loss of its empires. Others say that France is really Um, Ambassador, we're not able to hear you. Let me try and ring him. Yeah, okay, so I'm, then I would continue to speak in the, in the WhatsApp, or what, what do I do? Yeah. The audience, if they can hear. Hi, um, uh, Dr. Gangopadhyay, can you hear uh, Ambassador Mulya? Yeah, now I can hear him. Uh, I can also hear you. I can okay. also hear you. Yeah, let's just continue this way. Okay. Sorry about that. Could we request no, no. you to please... Um, start maybe from the beginning a couple of minutes so that you know we know where, you know the we, context. where, where, where what was the last thing that you heard did you hear about the french paradox or not no no we did not just no. before the french paradox okay well so i was saying that the all the indicators were good and um yeah and you know any other and my video has been stopped by the host. Can you allow me to start it? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, but my, I get to, yeah, now the video has started also. I'm sorry about all this. The uh, internet connection seems to be a little sad around here. Anyway, so what I was saying was that the things were going quite well. France was even doing as well as Germany, which was quite an achievement for France. But the French were not happy and they were out in the streets France was in the midst of the longest strike that you ever had in its history. And people were very, un very unhappy for various reasons. Uh, so the people said, why is it? That is the French paradox. The French seem to be a, a pessimistic people. This is the general consensus. Whatever the situation, and the reasons advanced are many. Some people say it is because France is in search of identity after the loss of its empire and its great power status and so on. Others say that France is really, uh, they're the part of the globalization and the victims of the globalizations are searching for a new way of life. Yet others say that there is a problem with uh, terrorism and immigration and so on. So the French feel lost in their own country. And yet others say that the French are just simply unable to enjoy life despite all the advantages that the country confers on them right from the system of cradle to grave um, you know, social security and health insurance. So you take your pick, whatever the reasons could be. But the fact is that the French are generally not happy and quite happy. But part of the reason also is that the French set a great deal of store with the, by the state. They have this hate, love-hate relationship. The state is the protector. The state is the provider. And at the same time, if anything goes wrong, the state is the first thing that they, that they would blame. So this was the situation and at the end of last year. And now, of course, things have become very different in the sense of what has happened. Um, you see, at the, at the end of the last year, around this time, Macron was completing, almost completing his third year. He was about to reboot his presidency. He had stood up to the unions. He had carried on with the, with the um, reforms that he's promised to do, some of them. And he was keen on carrying on with his reform, the biggest reform of the pensions, 
because as some of you might know, France has diff 42 different systems of pensions and the attempt was to, to, to re regularize them and make them into one based on points. I wouldn't go into the details of that, but that's quite a complicated system. But the reform, he, just as he was about to do that, and the unions, the trade unions, and the general public seemed to be exhausted by the strike. And he was, Macron also had learned his lessons during this period, because like Rajiv Gandhi, he had it very easy in his first year. Whatever he could do, whatever he did, he could do no wrong. And he carried out a couple of reforms. And the reasons for that were simple. Because of his surprise victory in the election, presidential election in 2017, uh, the opposition was totally devastated. There was no mainstream opposition. Immediately after his presidential election, his party, which was really a movement and not a political party with a proper political machine, managed to get the, uh, a good majority in parliament. So there was really no opposition to him excepting the opposition in the street. Of course, what people didn't realize at that time, that the combined hard left and combined right, hard right, together had about 40% support during the, during the presidential election. Macron won the election by 66% of the vote against Marine Le Pen, but a lot of it was due to vote anti-Le Pen. His own score in the first round, which was 24%, and as you might know, the second round, when there is no clear victor with 50% of the majority, in the second round, people, the top two fight it out. So the trick was, to get into the second round, Macron, a relatively unknown person with no political experience or background except for the few years with President Hollande, uh, trumped everybody. The, the front runner was a man called Fillon, who was the prime minister, but he still destructed because of a number of scandals that suddenly emerged. And Macron emerged and this, as, as the winner in the first round. And then all the anti Le Pen vote came to him. So he got 66%, but it, it was important to bear in mind that his real support, core support was the 24% people who voted for him. And also, uh, even after the second round, it's really only the 43% of the total electorate that was voting, that was supporting him. So in a certain sense, it, it was like Clinton's first term in the United States. But anyway, so Macron, I think things began to go too well for him. I mean, he started, he started saying that it was a Jupiterian presidency, that he was going to, uh, to, to do things his own way. And he managed to do some of these things. And the first year went swimmingly well because uh, even, even the trade unions and everybody was shell-shocked. There was no state protest. But then a couple of things started happen. They, they happened. <laughs> things started going wrong. The first thing that happened was, uh, was the affair Benalla, one of his uh, trusted bodyguards was caught uh, interfering in the police work and so on. And there were some ill-conceived attempts to, to protect him, that backfired. And as if that was not enough, the second and the, and the, and the major thing started was the, the, the fuse that was lit by the Yellow Vest movement. It started on a very simple issue. The, the people were fed up by the government's idea, first of all, rise in the petrol prices. And second, because they used their cars and there was a restriction on the speed limit. So one lady got fed up on this, about this and complained on the internet. And suddenly she found a, a, an unsolicited or what shall I say, unprecedented response. As a result of this movement gathered strong, strong, and the government was simply unable to deal with it because anybody who had any kind of grievance just joined it. You know, if I would want to make too many taxes, I want to that side. So, and the government's initial reaction was rather ham-handed. They didn't handle it well. But anyway, at the end of the year, I think the Macron and the government had learned their lesson. He appeased the thing. There was a consultation, national consultation, followed by a, uh, a, a referendum to take into account the, the grievances of the population. There were something like uh, 10 billion euros pumped into the economy to boost consumption, which was one of the biggest demands of the, of the population. And Macron seemed ready at the beginning of the last year to get on with his reforms agenda. He in fact sign signaled that he was ready to do that. And then of course the COVID thing happened and all bets were then off. 
COVID came and like most of the other governments, the French government was totally unprepared to deal with it. They didn't, uh, they underestimated the, 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 the scope and the uh, magnitude of this phenomenon. And there were flip-flops. People were first advised not to use masks. It later on turned out that people, the government didn't have enough number of masks. Then there was a problem about the hospital beds, the infrastructure for health, despite France being one of the best countries for, for healthcare, the infrastructure was found to be woefully inadequate to deal with an emergency of this nature. And the death toll mounted, you know, one, the death toll in France, for example, has been one of the one of the largest compared to the population. As of now, about 68,000 people have died. And, you know, the second wave is continuing. So the situation went out of control in, in a certain sense. Then the people, then the lockdown was imposed in a, in a hurried manner. But then the after, and the lockdown did show certain results. But then there was a second wave came around September because during the easing of the lockdown, the population did not follow the distancing and masks and those rules. So it was evident that second wave would come and came and which meant opening up, uh, imposing a second lockdown. But the on the other hand, the government's response to the economic, on the economic front was massive and immediate. The government unlocked something like 400 billion euros, which is a very massive sum. And for the, for the twin objectives, the first of all, to save as many jobs as they could, because that is the most important issue, employment in front. And secondly, to prevent as many bankruptcies as they could. And this was done, this, this money was available for various reasons. The first one was about, you know, you could get a, a, a debt guaranteed by the state. And this happened to be, uh, you know, then guaranteed by the state. So the banks who had been given money would lend to people. They were unwilling to lend it because of the risk. So the government said, with, you know, up to 70% of this debt, the debt we will guarantee. The second thing that they did was also the furlough situation, where people were encouraged to, even if they, the, the factories and offices were closed, people were asked to work from work, and the businesses were allowed to pay them, and the government footed the bill up to about 70% or 80% of that amount. So these kinds of ingenious measures really helped, and the economy continued to float. Obviously, there was a there was a, there was a you know the big bubble of the debt and people the critics the, the good economists have wondered how long the situation continue, where is the money going to come to pay for all this? Because the government on the other hand has spoken about no taxes, but without the taxes, they already the deficit is uh, budget deficit is bulging, and of course the fringe debt national debt is way over hundred percent at the moment. But anyway, these questions have been put aside for the time being, and the, on, on a war footing, the economy is being handled. But even then, there are now recent events, the recent indicators that things may come to, come to a bit of a, a head, because just after the latest figures in September say that about 350,000 new jobless applications have come in, which is as a result of the second lockdown, which started around there. And after that, the figures are not yet available, but people are afraid that they might be a lot worse. So this is the situation. So the, president, the presidential ambitions are a bit scuppered. And um, Macron, uh, Macron's reforms are stalled. The pension reform was passed uh, in, the, in, in, in the assembly by using a, a particular provision of the constitution, which prevents a, 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 massive debate because the opposition has put thousands of amendments to it. So the government used a bit like what we do here in India, an ordinance way, and their reform is passed. But it is not implemented. The idea was to discuss it with various stakeholders and to, to see what will be the way to implement it, where the money for it is going to come, how the social partners are going to share this burden. But none of this has happened, and now it has been postponed to this year. So now we don't know when it will come. Everything has now been put on the back burner after this, uh, until this uh, emergency is over. So that is one aspect of it. And so last two years, last year and a half of the Macron presidency um, will probably be a holding operation. 
Paradoxically, again, the people who were unhappy with uh, Macron's handling of the, uh, the yellow vest and other things now seem to think that he has improved. He is no longer arrogant and pro-rich, probably as a result of the uh, consult national consultation process that he had. And his approval ratings have actually gone up at the moment. Whether that is a trend or not, it's difficult to say at this particular stage, but then we will see how it goes. There's still a year and a half before the next presidential election. And um, we will see what happens. At the moment, there is no rival from the mainstream who is in sight, who could challenge Macron. Although on the right, the uh, xenophobist party of Marine Le Pen, the Rassemblement National, is gaining strength. And a lot of people are joining it because they're fed up of terrorism and which they blame on immigration. So that brings us to the current situation of what's going on. And it is this, that during the year, while the economic emergency was going on, you also had terrible problems about, uh, you know, the terrorism and other things, which has forced the government, you know, the, the, beheading, the, the beheading of the teacher called Samuel Patti, who dared show, uh, have a discussion in his class about uh, the, the Charlie Hebdo cartoons, which have been very well known around, which show depict the prophet Muhammad in a certain way. And uh, there, was a, there was a hate campaign against him on, online. And as a, 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 a Chechen immigrant who was there, decided to not only kill him, but to behave him. There were also other attacks. There was an attack in Nice. So I think the cup of the, cup of the sorrow was beginning to play full. People wanted stronger action from the government. And the government has now reacted in the manner of producing a law, which it doesn't call anti-Islamist because there's no word Islam or Islamism or radical Islam into that at all. What it calls is the protection of the Republic law. Uh, defending the values of the Republic, the foremost among them being laicite or the what we call secularism in English. Of course, the French concept of secularism is quite different from our concept of secularism in this country. It is an absolute separation of jobs and powers between the state and the church. This was as a result of Catholic churches and Pope's interference into the, into the affairs of the state and so on. So once for all, at the age of enlightenment, they put an end to that. And now there is a law which has been codified in 1905, which governs the entire state structure about how to go about it. So to strengthen that, I think what, what the provisions of the law are there, which I will just briefly mention, it's that without using the word Islam, or, uh, you know, it says it, it, it the, in the pretext and in the prefix, the prime minister has talked about that the government is fighting radical Islamism and terrorism, which is the enemy of the state and for this they are doing it. And what are some of the provisions which have angered some of the Muslims, although not all Muslims, some of them actually supported the, the new law. And the law says the, among these provisions is one is prohibiting the doctors from giving virginity certificates which some of the conservative Muslims are before the uh, Second is not allowing uh, children over the age of three to be educated at, uh, at home or in private madrasas. As you know, the education in France is free uh, up to a certain level. And despite that, a number of Muslim immigrants, it is said, are not sending their children, but they're going to the illegal or illicit madrasas which have sprung up over the years. The other thing that is targeted is the community organizations and the mass mosques. They have been uh, brought under the law. There, there will be more questioning about where the funding is coming, how are, what are their activities, and there will be a general control over it. Already there is a law and there is a movement about the Islam of France, which successive governments have tried to bring in, but not without much effect. Some imams have you know, because in the old days, the imams used to come to be from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar, from North Africa, but the funding was coming from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey, and to a certain extent, Morocco and Algeria. The government is, is trying to put a stop to it. It has succeeded to a certain extent, but the malaise is not completely gone. So we will see how the law, the law has been um, adopted in the, in the Council of Ministers. It will be coming before the assembly 
in a, in a short while during this month. And then we'll see how the debate is. The hard left is likely to oppose it, saying that you know this unfairly targets the Muslim community. Many of the Muslim people, many of them are, I mean, most of them are really law-abiding people. They are saying that we are being unfairly targeted because of the activities of a, of a few radicals and so on. So we will see what the fate of the law is. It will be passed though, because although the government does not have a majority in its own, on its own, it has got allies in the centrist parties and they, the law will pass if it, it is debated. Another, another provision which has come up as a result of this thing is insecurity, etc. Because every time there is a demonstration, a, a, a public protest, there are people, the hooded people, hooligans, who come and attack the police. They attack the police, they attack the shops, they attack the banks, whatever they can do. It's a very destructive moment. The police are, in a certain sense, are at the end of their tether. Many policemen have been targeted and killed when they have been off duty. So there is a great deal of discontent in the police. They feel that the, the government is not protecting them. So this law, the, the law on security, is intended basically to uh, keep these people, the police, give more protection to police. Most of its provisions are uh, non-controversial, but there's one which is extremely controversial. And that it is concerning the um, filming of the policemen on duty and disseminating that information with a view to harming the policeman or uh, targeting him in a certain sense. Of course, France being France, a number of um, people raised concerns, including people who are talking about the freedom of press and expression. The media said that, you know, if you do that, we cannot film police excesses and we will not then be able to, to do our duty. So that particular provision has been watered down, but the opposition to that still remains. So this is the situation in France at, at, at generally at the moment. Immigration, terrorism, and COVID are the three major problems that France is battling. Uh, if, you, if you see the trends that are going on, and at the moment, the um, second lockdown is not completely lifted. I mean, those of you who know Paris will be hard pressed to imagine Paris today without restaurants, bars, and cafes. I mean, it's the whole cafe society culture is absent. That's supposed to end by 20th of January because the government was worried about the effects of opening these things about COVID, uh, particularly during Christmas and so on. Shops were also not allowed to function fully. So all this is likely to change after 20th of January as of now, unless the date is extended any further. But a lot of people feel that once that has happened, a lot of pent up emotions might come up. There may be social strife, there may be street protests against the, uh, against the COVID, the handling of the government, and all kinds of pent up emotions are likely to spill over into the street. We are hoping that it doesn't happen, but we have to be prepared for that kind of a thing. So this is the internal situation about which a number of people were curious, and I was asked to, to elaborate on that. Coming to the external thing, I think the Macron um, presidency has handled things rather well. France is again punching above its weight, it has become again quite important in the uh, in the EU. Uh, the French and German partnership, which is considered the motor for running of the EU, is functioning well. Part of the reason for enhanced French importance again is also the, the then impending Brexit, which has now taken place, and also the relative eclipse of Chancellor Angela Merkel, because she was seen to be as a kind of a lame duck. Of course, she has bounced back now. But Macron has established a very, very good relationship with her and has managed to carry the Germans along with his plans. There are still differences about their ideas about the EU. France wants, the Germany wants to, you know, uh, enlarge the EU by getting more states into it. France would rather have deep, a deepening of the EU by giving more power to the to the institutions that still exist at the moment, and also giving, creating more things like a, a, a coordinated fiscal and financial policy. But there is opposition to that from two sides, from the newly uh, liberated or independent states from Eastern Europe who have joined uh, EU, as well as from the liberals, the so-called liberals. Britain was the top of them, but also Scandinavian countries and Netherlands, etc. 
So on those, these, those issues, the differences remain. But Macron's greatest achievement was that he pushed and pushed and got Germany to agree to the EU issuing bonds in the name of uh, to, to, to finance the countries which are in difficulty as a result of COVID, particularly countries like Germany, I'm sorry, not Germany, Greece, Italy, and Spain. And after the initial reluctance and over the opposition of the Bundesbank, which is a great power in, in Germany, finally, uh, Madame Merkel agreed to that. And a bond program has been passed in the European Parliament, which is a, which is a great thing. It's about 450 billion uh, in grants and 410 billion euros, which are vast sums of money in loans to the needy government. The disbursement is supposed to start very shortly, although it has already been delayed because it is proposed in June and it's passed in July. But these are some of the achievements that uh, Macron has had. He has also had a great deal of success in dealing with Brexit because they handled it. Some of you might remember that a year, many years ago when Francois Hollande was the president of France and he had, um, he was known for his, you know, anti-capitalist, uh, policies, etc. at the beginning of his term. And Boris Johnson, the then uh, mayor of Britain, had gone on to TV and told French people, come vote with your feet and come, in, come to London, which is a great center. I think the situation is quite reversed now, but because of the impending Brexit and other things, as well as because of the reforms that Macron has paid, so particularly reform of the uh, reform of the um, labor market, which was very inflexible before, hire and fire was impossible in France. A lot of these provisions have now been simplified. And also because of the uh, reduction in the rate of the corporate tax, etc. many foreign businesses are now looking at France. They are actually coming. And many companies which want to leave London because of the Brexit effect are considering on, are, or are already in France, along with Germany and Frankfurt or Amsterdam. So, so Paris is quite, you know, the, the French economy and the, you know, the Brexit issue has been handled well. On the core issues on which the French wanted their, uh, their, uh, their say to be heard, was heard in the last few days. And I think their position was quite simple, put very simply. They were saying to the Brits that you cannot have your cake and eat it too. If you want to have access to the free trade area in, um, of the EU as a whole, then you need yourself also to, 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 to agree to abide by the EU rules in certain area. And I think that has been the compromise. Francis, one important issue was the fishing rights, because that's a politically sensitive issue. So, you know, people fishing in the channel and the British waters, etc. But that has been accepted, but there's been a compromise that will go on for a number of years, but I think it's about 2026. And then Britain will have progressive access to its own waters. And, uh, but if they prohib prohibit other European countries, including France, to fish in their waters, then their exports of fish, etc., the EU could be, pro could be taxed. So it's, uh, and, and if there is a problem, then there will be um, arbitration, not by the European Court of Justice, because Britain doesn't accept them, but by an international arbitration. So Brexit has been so far handled fairly well. Other issues on the, on the US, the relationship under Trump was not always happy. After the famous man-to-man uh, -man shake hand that, uh, that shook, uh, that became a talking point of the media, uh, Trump and Macron had an uneasy relationship. I think the main issues were the climate with the US walking out of the climate accord, despite entreaties by France and other countries not to do that. Then there was also the issue about NATO. The, the French and, and the, the US is now slowly trying to, un, un, to take away their troops and want to spend less and less money asking the Europeans, and I think to a certain extent quite justifiably, to spend more money on their security. But there have been issues about that and that has affected the thing. Also the third issue that has been is about the French idea to impose taxes on the uh, various, uh, on, the, on the digital companies, the, what do they call the GAFA, you know, uh, Google, uh, uh, Facebook, etc. Because they, they fear, they, they, the argument is that they make a lot of money abroad, but they don't pay taxes. And such taxes should be paid in France. 
So France wanted to impose those taxes. US retaliated by simply saying to them that you cannot, and you will have to, uh, if you do that, we will tax your champagne, your cheese, etc., etc. But then the OECD got into their act and said, look, why don't we agree on a, on a, a, a general regime which would be acceptable to everybody? And then we will see how it all works out. So that has been uh, the position. There are hopes that the Biden presidency will be more amenable for compromises rather than uh, uh, the, the outgoing Trump presidency, but we'll see that. With China, which is another very important relationship, and I think Emmanuel Baum, who was here, the French advisor to, to the president, diplomatic advisor to the president, was recently in India to discuss with Ajit Doval the strategic partnership. He put it quite clearly. He said, we adhere by the EU position. France, I mean, China is a partner, it is a competitor, and it's a systemic rival. So we try to manage our relationship by maximizing our gains with the relationship with China, but at the same time, by not uh, allowing it to play uh, outside the rules of the international, uh, outside the international rules. They must abide by that game. So there are tensions. I think the sound of world diplomacy is also playing out in France. The, the uh, Chinese ambassador went uh, ballistic on a couple of issues and criticized the French government. About it. He was called uh, to the Cato Osset, the foreign office, and was wrapped on the knuckles. But that's a difficult, that's a relationship that's being managed rather than being very happy. And on another level, the French business and other people are quite worried about China. There is a fear that the Chinese, Chinese are too aggressive. They are taking over too many things. And now that they, are strong, they feel strong enough, they're flexing their muscle. One of the immediate fear is that, you know, many of the assets because of the Corona crisis have become rather cheap. And, uh, you know, they were fear that some of the Chinese companies might come and buy these on the cheap and then have a kind of stranglehold of the French economy. That's not come true. The French government has a, a slew of laws to prevent that kind of thing because calling them strategic assets and so on and so forth. So that's unlikely to happen. But there is a general wariness about China. Now we come to India. You know, I didn't speak too much about India, I don't intend to, simply because Ambassador Lana, who was in this space a few, a few weeks ago, has spoken about it at, at length. But I will touch on the, some of the salient points, and then we can talk about it if there are more, more questions and answers that require about it. I think France has now accepted that India is one of its important strategic partners. In 1998, an agreement was signed, which made, makes the two countries strategic partners as a result of which consultations take place regularly. And not only that, but exchange of information. So in all kinds of issues, not only trade, commerce, economy, but also issues like terrorism, counter-terrorism, uh, you know, uh, they, all these issues are under the gamut and there are various aspects of it which are being discussed and strengthened. Um, the, uh, the, this was not a macro initiative. Successive French governments have been paying, you know, recognizing India's importance, starting with Chirac, particularly after India started liberalizing, because until then, the French interest was sporadical or transactional. But after the liberalization, Chirac was the first person, it was followed by all his successors, and Macron has now deepened this particular relationship to a greater extent. And there have been exchange of high level visits, and so on and so forth. So there is, uh, there is a very, very important dimension to this relationship now. Also, there are several other factors that uh, bind France and India together. I mean, there are various things like the military co cooperation, the cooperation, the, field, the defense field is one of the most important. I mean, everyone knows about the 36 Rafale, which was reduced from original 126. But some of them already come in with the flying condition, more will be coming. There are other kinds of aircraft that um, are being proposed for India to buy. The interesting thing about France and, and, and defense technology is that while they do have the defense technology of, uh, you know, really the uh, state of the art, uh, sometimes even better than the US technology, etc. They, unlike many other countries, France is willing to share this technology. 
and entered into joint ventures with India. Their technology, mind you, is quite expensive, but if you're ready to pay the fees, they are willing to then share it. So I think a lot of this is happening. Apart from Rafal, they have been scorpion, and then there are uh, various other things are, which are in pipeline. A lot would depend on how much money India has to buy many of the things that are now being proposed. So this is an ongoing thing that will go on. But in the military and naval field also, there is a greater cooperation. Joint exercises are being here. France has declared itself an Indo-Pacific power because after all, France has more than a, a million people in the, in the Indian Ocean region, et cetera, given, by the, given the, its presence in the uh, Reunion Island. It is also a lot of other, uh, I mean, you know, it is a large economy zone. So there are interests of France. So in, there are a lot of convergence of interests about this, these matters. So this, thing, this cooperation is going on very well. Then there is a cooperation in the nuclear field as well. I mean, France has traditionally supported India when the Tarapur deal was in danger because Jimmy Carter at one stage said, we will not give you the heavy water. France did. And uh, even when the nuclear testing that was done in 1998, after an initial uh, outburst, France, France came around and helped quite a lot about help, uh, easing out the sanctions on India. France also is supporting India's bid to be in the NSG, the Nuclear Suppliers Group. And on the other issues like Security Council also, France is quite unequivocally supported India's claim to be a permanent member of the Security Council. There are others who support it too, but France has been much more forthright in coming out with this kind of thing. So on the nuclear field, as we, as we noted, there is an ongoing thing about the um, Jaitapur uh, reactor. It's stuck between uh, for negotiations, but it's not a dead end. I think people say that it might still be um, going on. Then there is the there are the economic issues. You know, you've got the joint committee. The economic exchanges are increasing, but they are not up to the potential. The two sides had agreed on very ambitious targets, but it had simply not happened. And I think. But, but there are going things going to happen because of the purchases about in the military field and other things. Uh, but at the moment, the trade is not terribly important, despite the effort. But then there is, of course, the diaspora in, in, of the Indians in France, which is much, much less as compared to many other countries like the UK, Canada, or even Germany. The reason has been that um, well, India, the, the, the language and the different system of education, etc. But things are now changing. Now there are more than 100,000 French Indian people living in France. And there are about three, uh, three million or two or three million Indian origin people are in, uh, in uh, overseas territories like uh, Reunion Island and the Martinique and Guadeloupe where traditionally Indians are gone. There's a large, a large component. Uh, a large component of this was, of course, uh, uh, the uh, um, people who were who were there taken as uh, slave labor. But they are now settled down and they got the French nationality also. But um, the um, so uh, the, the um, uh, I'm sorry, I can't stop this telephone. I'll try. Just give me a second. But it stopped on its own. So. The diaspora is playing its role, and the, the composition of diaspora has changed. In the old days, it was simply the Pondicherry people and some workers from Gujarat and Punjab, etc., not really immigrant. But now, more and more people, professionals, are coming into France, holding important positions in multinationals. Uh, you know, many of them are CEOs, etc., and so on. There are French companies also. I mean, you know, I said that the economic exchanges are not very good, but still there are there is substantial exchanges. There are about a thousand companies operating, French companies operating in India. They have something like uh, two hundred thousand people on their payrolls, and they they, they have several billions in their turnover. There are about a hundred Indian companies operating in France, and uh, this. Is, No, no, it's a, 
Uh, and then you have the, um, the, I'm sorry about that interruption. And then you have the, um, the you know, the, um, the, the are Indians, about 1.6 billion people, um, uh, sorry, 1.6 billion investment of Indians in France, about a thousand, uh, about a hundred companies, and they employ something like 20,000 people. So the trend is encouraging, only it is not being completed. So these are some of the highlights that I, oh, there, are, and there are the issues about where the, the cooperation can grow in the economic field. And there's several areas. The most important among them being infrastructure, like roads, airports, and ports. Then there are other issues. The France is very much involved into the smart cities. And it's been earmarked three, three cities like Nagpur, Chandigarh, and Namadwan, where France can have priority provided their proposals are good. France is a partner with India on the, on the climate. The agency was set up between India and France during the climate summit in 2016. And that the cooperation is proceeding quite well. And um, then there are uh, other, other programs also, which are, uh, uh, which are other areas in which France can help, you know, like water, electricity, um, and the cleaning of Lord Ganges, and many uh, various other issues. So the trend is encouraging and trend is growing. And uh, let us hope that it continues because there are many things which are common between India and France. There are many convergences and they need to be, they need to be uh, encouraged and built upon. Finally, of, of course, there is the greatest similarity between the French and the Indians that each one of us thinks in both countries that the government is zero. They don't know what to do. Sit in a, so people sit in the cafes, attack the government and there are better solutions to everything. And of course, when it comes to voting, many of them don't go and vote. So I think there are several of these similarities between India and France, but uh, that is the way it is. I'm sorry, I seem to have taken a lot of time, but uh, partly it is because of the, uh, uh, these interruptions, but I hope it has not been too much. Over to you, Chairman. Thank you, Ambassador. The, you have uh, covered a lot of aspects, a lot meaning I would say I, I could not think of anything that you have uh, left out. Whether they are working or not working, you have been very clear in um, explaining what is working and what is not working. I also liked your distinction between what France is doing internally and what France is doing externally. Now, the, since uh, time is short, what I will do is I will um, first pose the questions that have come to me, to you. Okay. And um, then if there is time, then I will ask you one or two questions, yes. So the first question is from uh, Latika Padgaonkar. Oh. Uh, so the question is the following, that um, Macron was a member of the Socialist Party at one time. Mm -hmm. What happened in his life and career that made him become what she calls a centrist liberal? Well, I think, I think the short answer to that is opportunism. Because Macron is not a is not, is not a politician. He's a, as Latika would know, he was a trained civil servant. He was the ENARC, you know, the institute from where all the top civil servants and leaders of French society come. And he also became a Rothschild banker. He left the service for a while, made a bit of a money in um, making joint ventures and acquisitions, and then he returned because he had political ambitions. But he had no political experience. He had never been elected to any office other than the presidency. So when he, Francois Hollande had become extremely unpopular and he was looking for people who might help him reboot the French thing, get, so propose some reforms and clear away the image that he was um, a, a, an unfriendly president to the business. So Macron was, Macron was recommended to him. He, Macron joined uh, Hollande's staff, became his uh, you know, deputy chief of staff in the, uh, in the thing. But then he was not happy because he wanted to, he, he brought some reforms in about the opening of the supermarkets on Sundays, et cetera, but they were small reforms because the presidency would not allow him to go beyond. But then what happened was that Macron wanted to, to have a greater say. He wanted to be minister of economy. That didn't happen, but then the vacancy opened. So he had resigned and he was brought back. And there he started doing, you know, getting more and more, uh, his, his, he started getting, more into the act of uh, de defining policy, etc. 
he was, Hollande had become so unpopular that most people didn't expect him to run for a presidency. The Socialist Party was divided. There were many claimants who wanted to, uh, to stake the claim. And they were, uh, so for, uh, you know, and they, they had their primary, which was a very divisive primary. Similarly, on the other side, uh, on the on the so-called center-right mainstream opposition, which was the, uh, you know, the Sarkozy party, there also they felt the, the um, uh, what you call it, the um, primaries for the first time ever. And Fillon emerged as the candidate because he had a good image. He was the president. So he he wanted to, uh, he was emerged, but he self-destructed self because of his um, scandals about the, with his wife being given an em employment and job, which was she was not supposed to do, etc. She was not declared. Anyway, so Macron sensed his opportunity, and he's what he started with what he called a movement, which he said, which was not of the left, which was not of the right. He said this cleavage, this old cleavage between left and the right, has become completely outdated, and we need to get on to to, to a new way. A lot of people who were tired of this bickering in the political parties, particularly the young people were attracted to, to this idea and to centrist idea. He said, we don't want to have the dogma of doctrine. We want to do things which are good for France and we want to do them quickly and without fuss. So a lot of people started joining his movement, which is called Amar. Alain got very worried and suspicious about what Macron's intentions were about this. And he started, Inquiries week started making. But by this time, Macron continued with his march. He joined, he saw his opportunity, and his party was then converted, uh, his mass movement was converted into a party. But the party remained a movement. It didn't have a political structure as what I said. It didn't have a political machine. And Macron was a long shot for this. But he decided to try it. I mean, he was the youngest man to be elected. Uh, in, under the Fifth Republic. He, he was not yet 40 when he took over, and he was the youngest uh, head of state in France since Napoleon, uh, be, because of the young people. And then the, the dynamics of the second, say, the, 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 the way the French electoral system worked, the presidential electoral system, because if nobody can get a 50% majority, absolute majority in first round, the top two go for, the, for a runoff. And so the trick was to be in the second round, because in the second round, if either Marine Le Pen, who's extreme right, or Mélenchon, who's extreme left, hard left, who, mind you, between two of them got 40% of the vote in the first round, but separately, if any of them was going to be a candidate, all the mainstream parties will, will hold, as they say, hold their nose and vote for the other candidate with Macron, which is exactly what happened. But Macron was to Latika, to answer your question, Macron was a socialist, but nobody is quite sure about his conviction as a socialist. I think he was, it was a way to get into the political system, and it was a way to see opportunities that might open, open up for him. But after his Rothschild experience, where he was a banker, he was always a centrist, he was always a liberal. So I think he's following up on those policies now, now that he has the opportunity. <coughs> There is a second question from uh, Siva Das. I am not very sure about the question being asked, so I will put it in my own way. Yeah. Which is um, uh, in this global world, right? And given that today we are moving away from, there is a lot of pressure in almost every country, and uh, best typified probably by Brexit and US protectionism, that we are trying to move away from globalization. So what is Macron's view on, views on these? Well, Macron is not per se against globalization, but I think the globalization experience in France has been a sobering one because there have been a lot of people who consider themselves as victims of globalization simply because many of the jobs have gone away, uh, not only to Asia, but also to other European countries. And for instance, the We may have lost him. Some people Never against globalization, but it's also turned them against EU, which is a, become a good 
skip go. So, uh, Ambassador, Ambassador, if I, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you, but we just lost you in the middle. So, could you please uh, go okay, back? Where, where, where did you lose me? Can you tell me? You, you just said now? that they had lost jobs. The French had no, lost jobs. They lost the jobs. And I was saying they didn't lose the jobs only to Asia and, you know, cheaper countries, and, you know, companies shifting to China, Vietnam and other places. But also the labor coming in from other European EU member countries from East Europe. Because mm -hmm. the EU laws permit these countries labor to come to France or to UK and to work on the salaries that they receive in their own countries, which are much less than the minimum wage that France offers. So I don't think Macron will now pursue globalization actively. He's not certainly against it, but I think the line would be to pursue it where it benefits France. And also don't forget that there has always been a strong streak of dirigism in, in the French state. So whenever there is a threat perceived to one of the jewels of the French industry, then they bring in the strategic consideration and try and prevent this. I mean, a classic case of that was the Danone in a few years ago when there was some talk that some other companies might come and take over Danone by a hostile takeover. The French state actually invoked strategic stake in a, in a yogurt making company. So this is not the flavor of the month, so to say. I'm now going to ask you a, um, a question since you mentioned the climate change uh, and the fact that um, France is one of the big pushers of uh, climate related issues, right? That um, now you know that India has um, taken um, at least um, in, our, in what we say and also in set the targets that we have set, that there is a big push towards a uh, better environment and whatever needs to be done, right? But somehow the technology transfer does not happen mm -hmm. to India. And it's difficult for India to uh, make those changes. Is there a possibility with, of any uh, such deals with France in terms of climate technology transfer? I think there is a very good chance of it. I mean, I, I don't know what exactly has gone on in the discussions between the, the two people, but my interaction with the French industry has, gives me the indication that there are people who are willing to help. As I said, the French are not <coughs> unwilling to share technology. It's a question of price. Very often their, their technology is very costly. So it's a question of the buyer is willing to pay the right price, the technology transfer will. There is no prohibition from the French state for such transfer of technology. So I think if we ask for it, and you know, in certain states, it is already happening. For instance, <clears throat> I mentioned the smart city that, you know, which is a pet project in India. And several cities have been earmarked, and at least three cities have been earmarked for France. And, you know, there is, I know that the consortia have been formed in France where people have been uh, actually working and waiting for certain clearances from the Indian side to actually participate in the creation of the smart cities. In Nagpur and Chandigarh, these are the two cities that come immediately to mind. And I have heard that the complaints from the French side that the delays on the Indian side, I've not been able to ascertain it independently, whether that in fact is the case. But yes, I think the, there, and also there is on the, on the technology, uh, on, the, on the climate issue, France and India have joined, jointly made that international organization. And cooperation is going quite well, I'm told. So I see no reason why we could not get um, if the, the, the technology that we need from France if uh, the terms are right. Okay, we, we, we are uh, running uh, behind schedule. So the, Sorry about that. No, 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 it's not your fault. Um, these are things outside your control. We in India are fully aware of these things that can happen. Now, but I, I would want to now ask you a question that has been put in, the, um, which is that in the outside world, this is from Subhash Kirtane. Mm -hmm. In the outside world, we hear that France would eventually be a country strongly influenced by Muslim culture, aggressive for that matter. How is that being handled from the point of view of destruction that takes place as a result? I, you know, whatever the question. I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? I didn't quite yeah, get so, it. So, so, so I guess the question is that um, there is a strong influence that is developing, right? Strong influence and? Strong influence that is developing in yes. France mm -hmm. 
by outsiders, especially the Muslim culture, mm -hmm. which in many ways, as you explained before, is mm -hmm. anathema to them constitutionally, right? Yes. That the state stays away from religion. Mm -hmm. so, so what do you think is going to happen given that uh, Macron has taken these recent steps and the recent incidents that have prompted him to take those steps? I think, I think the center of gravity in France is certainly shifting towards right. I mean, you know, a few years ago, if such a stringent uh, law, which is uh, um, the law for protection of the Republic will value, but which is called anti-Islamist by the, a lot of Muslims, had been proposed, there would have been howls of protest in France from the liberal elite. That is not happening anymore. And in fact, almost 70% of the French people support this kind of, a, of an initiative. And there are good reasons for that, because, you know, among the young people, among the young Muslims, unfortunately, there are various reasons for that, because there's been ghettoization, they've been put into the thing, there's lack of education, there's lack of parental control. Uh, then again, the mosques creating a certain amount of propaganda through, through Saudi and other influence at that time. And also the drugs, you know, people, young people are taken on drugs, and then they're asked to peddle drugs and the same thing which gives them easy money. They don't know what need to look for job or education. And they will, then they, then the Islamic strong jihadi propaganda is uh, inculcated and they are asked to go and fight. All this is being put a stop to. And I think French people, for instance, but the, it's, it's an indication of the way things are in France that in a recent poll, 57% of young Muslims under the age of 25 said that they prefer the primacy of the Sharia law over the Republican laws. So this is a this is a very worrying and serious situation. And a lot of a lot of this happens because delinquents are sent to prisons. And the prisons at the detention centers are the worst places where people become terrorists by coming into contact with other terrorists. So personally, I see the conflictual situation continuing without any, I think, I think personally, I feel the situation will get a little bit worse before it gets better. It will also depend on the French state's willingness and the ability to enforce the laws that they've passed, combined with the measures that they've promised, because the French state has accepted that they have not always treated all the Muslims fairly and so on and so forth, because particularly in the suburbs, there's ghettoization. There are 25 districts in France, which have now become uh, no-go districts for the police because you, you, can't, you can't go there. And reclaiming the, these for the Republic is one of the important, uh, uh, important objectives of the state. So all this is going to, to intensify. And I think uh, there will be some more social unrest, fueled by other reasons as well, but it will coalesce some of it. And let's only hope that the, it doesn't lead to greater terrorism, etc., etc. But the French public now is by and large strongly behind the government in the major cities. They do feel, you see there are about 6 million Muslims in, in France, which is the largest Muslim minority anywhere in Europe. And many of them are from the old colonies. And while the earlier generations who came, uh, they assimilated. No, there have been waves of immigrants, immigrants in France. There have been Poles, there have been Spaniards, there have been Portuguese, there have been Russians. But they were all Christians and they assimilated quite easily and moved upwards. Somehow this has not happened with the Muslims, partly because of their inability to, 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 to actively try and integrate in the culture, but also because of the way they have been treated in a certain ghettoized system, create a huge building, put them all there, create a football stadium there and leave them to their own, uh, own rico. So the French state has now said that they're going to take steps along with this law to remedy some of these grievances. Let us see what happens. But, but it is going, it, the problem is not going to go away by simply passing a law. It will be there and it will need deft handling. In fact, this last point that you made is, is a very European issue because it's not only France. I mean, in most European right. countries, you know, immigrants are ghettoized, especially yes. if they come from the Middle East or, or Muslims. Yeah. Well, anyway, we have um, uh, overshot our time. Ambassador, this was a fascinating discussion. Your uh, breadth and um, of the presentation was quite remarkable in the fact that you covered uh, everything and you clearly took some time to plan your uh, presentation. So thank you very much for that. On behalf of PIC, 
and myself, I would like to thank you for spending your valuable time with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you to PIC and thank you for this opportunity. It was a very enjoyable interaction. Although I'm sorry I overshot the time a bit and there was not enough. No, but you're overshooting the time. You're overshooting the time. I'm responsible for it because I'm supposed to maintain the time. It's not your thank fault. Thank you very much for letting me off the hook. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gangopathya. Thank you, Ambassador Mulle. This has been a really enlightening conversation and uh, many learnings, many takeaways. And uh, I want to say thank you to both of you for engaging with us. I think your conversation has opened up a whole new perspective on some of the challenges faced by and realities of present day France. So for that, you know, merci beaucoup. Uh, I also want to thank our PIC colleagues for their tremendous efforts behind the scenes. Thank you everyone in the office and if you're working from outside the office. And last but not the least, many thanks to all the members of the audience for your participation and your patience. Uh, we apologize once again for the connectivity issues at the beginning, but we hope that uh, uh, you know the, the lecture became clearer uh, later. And uh, we thank you for staying on, for remaining engaged, and we hope that you will join uh, all the future PIC events as well. Please stay tuned for updates on our website and social media pages. Ambassador Mulye, Dr. Gangopadhyay, we look forward to hosting you again in the near future. With that, we now conclude.